Thank you, other. Much appreciated. Thank you, Jordan, again. Where are you? Such a beautiful voice, and we all know where that came from, right? You're welcome. <laughs> well, happy birthday, by the way. It's her birthday today. She turned 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see you all here this morning. It's good to be here. Juice, I see you. Thank you for your support. It's always good to see Mike's handsome face. Of course, his beautiful wife. Just got to give a shout out to everyone here this morning. Well, anyways, without further ado, let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is with great joy for all of us to be here today under one holy roof. Father, especially when I'm given the opportunity to speak on your behalf this morning, please, Father, empty us of all, of everything, Father, that is evil and of not of you. Please pour out your Holy Spirit upon us all here today, Father, and please keep us, give us an open mind. And an open heart, Father, to receive your message with love and with humbleness. Father, this is my prayer. All right. You guys all have your Bibles with you. Please open it up and turn with me to the book of Romans. Book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 28, what Georgie, Brother Georgie, beautifully read this morning. Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. You guys all there? Amen. And it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. You know, this is one of my favorite verses I like to lean on uh, in these last days, uh, especially as we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? What are the first three words? And we know. Right? Not guess or think or, or hope or believe, but we know. Now, to know is to perceive or understand as fact or truth. To apprehend clearly and with certainty. And so what do we know? What are the next three words? What do we know? That all things, right? Now, all things aren't necessarily good. However, all things do what? They work together for good. To whom? To them that love God. To them who are called according to whose purpose? To his purpose. Now, no matter the circumstances, there are only two qualifiers, right? How many did I say? Two qualifiers for God to be working all things together for our good. First qualifier, he works for the good of those who love him. You know, if you truly love God, you can certainly trust that he's working for your good. Amen? Because the thing is, he loves you back. Right? As a matter of fact, he loved us first. Right? And when you truly love someone, you make it a priority. Right? You make it a priority to seek that individual's welfare. Right? Right? You do whatever it takes for the well-being of that individual. Amen? Now, the second qualifier 
He works for those who are called according to His purpose. Okay? Now, do you all realize that following God entails submitting to His purpose for you? Do you guys know that? Following God entails submitting to His purpose for you. In other words, following God requires you to surrender, right, the plans you have for yourself for the plans He has already laid out for you. And, you know, it's no surprise that every single person I'm standing before here this morning has been called for a purpose that God, that God holds for your life. Amen? Now, the wording of this verse indicates that these two qualifiers you know, that we're talking about here, loving God and experiencing his call, um, are actually one in itself, okay? Those who love God are called according to his purpose, and vice versa, right? Those who are called according to his purpose are the, are, love God, amen? Well, you guys all with me now? Well, okay. Now, let's talk about the good mentioned here in this verse, because... Being called according to God's purpose also reminds us of what our good actually is. And it's not quite what some people might think it is. Because, let me tell you something, it's not necessarily the, the, you know, the type of, of, of career we have, all right? Nor is it even the type of you know, car that we drive or the amount of money we have in the bank. Right? It's not about what makes us comfortable or how successful we are in this world. Our good that Paul's talking about here is actually the furthering of his purpose through us. Okay? That's what Paul's talking about here, the furthering of God's purpose through us. That is the good he's talking about. David even tells us, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That is from Psalms 84, 11. Isn't that wonderful? No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Now, God is intimately and actively involved in the lives of those who love him. For the ultimate purpose of his glory. Nevertheless, I, you know, I think we can all agree, all agree that God wants everything, right? He wants everything to work together for good for all his creation, doesn't he? You know, from the very beginning, that's his purpose, right? That's his desire for all of us. But because God loves us so dearly, he gives us choices. And whenever you give people choices, there will always be outcomes or even consequences, right? Now, of course, you know, there have been many times in my life where I've made the wrong choice or choices where... God, fortunately, you know, he stepped in at some point in order to clearly keep me from carrying out those choices any further. Has that ever happened to you? You know, you choose something that you feel really good about, right? You've prayed about it, you're, you're confident, and you're excited. Well. Then all of a sudden, God ends up closing that door. And so, you know, you don't get the job that you really wanted, right? Or, or, or maybe that relationship didn't quite work out as expected. Amen? And so it's easy for us to sort of break down and give up. You know, it's so easy for us to allow rejection lead to discouragement. And to even think that God isn't even working in your life, you know, at times we're making things any better or easier for you. Amen? And it takes a toll on you. Right? Physically, mentally, spiritually. It takes a toll on you. But we got to realize, we got to understand, and, and here's what always seems to amaze me. And it's that through it all, he makes the choices that we make eventually all work together for good. By His grace, God, He's orchestrating, you know, every 
single event in our lives according to His good plan. Okay? Not our plan, but His good plan. And whether we, we, we notice it or not, you know, our role is simply to trust Him and allow Him to work in our lives. Amen? Because the thing is, God knows exactly what He's doing, right? He knows exactly what He's doing. We, you know, we, and He has, with a, with a purpose for each of us, that, that reaches just far beyond what we can even imagine. We can't even fathom what His purpose is for us. We're told in Ministry of Healing, page 41, that our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways. How many, how many, how many ways? A thousand ways of providing for us of which we know nothing. nothing. The Bible says His thoughts are not our thoughts, right? Yeah. Nor are His ways our ways. Meaning God's on a whole, he's on a whole nother level. Right? And very rarely does he do exactly as we think he will. You see, even though God likes to use good things to work out good, he also likes to use bad things to work out good. And one reason being is that God, he's omniscient. Am I saying that right? Omniscient, omniscient. It's like, it's like saying "wash this, wash this so He's omniscient, <laughs> right? He's all knowing. Okay, nothing in the future is a secret to him. Right? There's not, there's not one thing he doesn't know. And so he sees the choices that we're gonna make ahead of time, right? And what he does is that he arranges them. You know, he sets them up to where, in the end, they're used to his glory. So everything that we do is ultimately for his glory. Right? And so that's what he does. You know, now mind you, it might not make sense to you at first, or maybe even at all. But ultimately, ultimately that's what he's doing. God's working everything out for good, even in the circumstances where we don't immediately see the results. Now, another reason being, and this is probably the most important one, is that he simply, he simply doesn't want you to be discouraged. Okay, he doesn't want you to be discouraged. And, you know, we all get, you know, disappointed every now and then in, in one way or another, right? But if, here's the thing, if God, if he couldn't work anything good, out of a bad choice, then we'd all be hopeless, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, who died for us? Jesus Christ died for us. Romans 5.8, and that's, that's as good as it gets. Brothers and sisters, our greatest hope and assurance is in Jesus Christ. In that while we were still sinners, he died for us. And with a willing and faithful heart, he can turn our worst ever failures, disappointments, and mistakes into valuable, valuable resources, given the consequences that we face. And the Bible, as we know, is full of those types of stories, right? As a matter of fact, the whole plan of salvation is basically God's ability to take bad things, right? Is that right? He takes things for however bad they are, right? And completely, he completely turns them around. And I like how this, this fellow on um, the radio station termed it. He phrased it, he turns them around into trophies of his grace. Trophies of his grace. Take the story for Adam and Eve, for instance. You know, the first mistake to have ever been, been made in this world, right? The most epic fail at that. Now, when, when they sinned, did God, did God forsake them? Did he abandon them? 
No, he didn't. Were there any consequences for them? Yes. Definitely, right? And we all know how we, we all know what happened, right? Yes. The ground was was forever cursed, and you know the rest is history. But it was because of their sin that that all sin and death had now entered into the world, ultimately separating God from from all his children, right? Now, all of these bitter, bitter experiences as a result of their choice and failure to obey God. But yet God, you know, in spite of all these things, he, he still loved and cared about his children. So much that he provided a way back to him, you know, after this separation from sin. And it was a way, it was, it was, it was a process that involved object lessons, okay, that taught Salvation through faith in the promised Redeemer to come. Okay, so essentially the lessons, those lessons, lessons that pointed straight to what Jesus was, was, was coming to do, okay? And Sister White, she even describes it as a system of humble obedience, showing their reverence for God and their faith and dependence upon the promised Redeemer by slaying the firstlings of their flock and solemnly presenting them with the blood as a burnt offering to God. This sacrifice will lead them to continually keep in mind their sin and the Redeemer to come, who was to be the great sacrifice for man. That's from the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 54. Now let's look at the very first example we're given in the Bible, Genesis 4, 3, 5. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry. And his countenance fell. So God, God accepted Abel's offering because it fulfilled his requirement, right? However, for Cain, his was rejected because it was inadequate, right? Inadequate because his heart was rebellious, right? And, 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 and unwilling to adhere to God's requirements. And he refused to learn his lesson. He refused to learn, a les learn his lesson. <clears throat> Is that how we ought to be, church? Hard-headed and unwilling to learn from our faults? That being said, no matter, you know, the choices we make in life, if we are willing God can then work something good out for us. Otherwise, we'd be another sad story like Cain, right? He refused to learn his lesson. Yet the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want to read an interesting statement here that came to the servant of the Lord. Back in 1890, back in 1890, Juice was probably just a little boy at that time, right? Now, that year, Sister White had been invited to um, New York City to hold a meeting, right? And this is what came from her diary the morning after. It says, Brooklyn, New York, Monday, November 24th, 1890. I rise this morning with gratitude in my heart for a precious night's rest. The cars on the elevated railroad have been thundering past all night, but I have slept excellently well. I did not fill my appointment at the hall yesterday evening at 5 o'clock. The managers of the building led it to other parties when our people had engaged it for the day. 
But we could not help ourselves as there was no written contract. This ought always to be secured. We must be more thorough in our business management. Many had purposed to come with their unbelieving relatives, and this was a great disappointment to them. They wept with sorrow. This disappointment we must reckon among the all things that shall work together for good to those that love God. And that is from the manuscript release, Numbers 10.33. Now here they were, right? This, this Ellen White and her, her group of people, right? Trying to resume their meeting, you know, and doing God's work, right? But come to find out they failed to secure their reservation for the rest of the evening. So they had to cancel their meeting. Sister White even specified that they wept with sorrow because many had purposed to come with their unbelieving relatives, right? They brought guests, and this was a great disappointment to them. But then she immediately flipped the script, right? And she said, this disappointment must be reckoned, right? It must be considered to be among the all things that shall work together for good to those who love God. Now, did they love God? Absolutely. Right, so then how, how did a situation like that turn out positive for them after all? Well, the answer is actually in that statement I just read, and it was simply that they needed to be more careful. They simply had to be more careful. And to secure a written contract, and to be just, just to be more thorough in their business management, right? I mean, that's it. It's just as simple as that. They just needed to be more careful the next time around. Now, did God have the ability to, to make that meeting happen for them? Did he have that ability? Of course he did, right? But despite the significance of that meeting, right, despite the significance of it, God decided to shut that door in order to teach them something that was even more important than anything else that day. Isn't that something? Now, I bet you it didn't happen that way again. What do you think, George? <laughs> Good answer. It didn't happen again, I'm sure. This disappointment we must reckon among the all things that shall work together for good to those who love God. Every little thing, you know, including disappointments, amounts to our development in accomplishing God's purpose. My mouth is just super dry right now. Honey, can you give me some water, please? And so because they love God, they knew how much more he loved them more than ever to teach them something that day, right? Thank you. They knew how much more he loved them in order to teach them something that day. And that was their state of mind. Right? That was the way they thought. Should we think like that? You know, as Christians, we opt to be optimists, right? God is an optimist. And that's just one of many, you know, wonderful examples that we're given of how God teaches us these simple yet valuable lessons. Well, from ministry, page 152 reads this, do you make mistakes? Do not let this discourage you. The Lord may permit you to make small mistakes in order to save you from making larger mistakes. Go to Jesus and ask him to forgive you and then believe that he does. Now, honestly, I've made many, 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 many mistakes in my life to where I wish, you know, I was able to take a lot of them back. But 
you know, the truth is, if I had never made those mistakes, right, I would have never had the opportunities to learn my lessons. Amen? And, and, you know, who knows where I'd be today? You know, I probably wouldn't be here, you know? I'll tell you that much, and I, I certainly probably wouldn't be standing in front of you this morning sharing with you this message. But do you see what I mean? All throughout life, God is teaching us, and he's changing us for as much as we are willing, for as much as we are willing to allow him. You see, church, we're all, we're all students here. You know, we're all enrolled in the school of God, right? Let's call it the heavenly university. And in his university, believe it or not, one of the most important lessons we learn are from our mistakes. Because once you make a mistake, you're more than likely not to repeat that mistake for the most part, right? I mean, for me, it probably takes me like two or three times, right? And so throughout our whole life, you know, God is our teacher, right? And you would think that God would ever be so pleased if, with us if, if we never, ever made a mistake, right? And he would because, you know, that's his goal. But even though that would have been, you know, the ideal thing to do from the beginning, he never once opted to control us. And because God truly, truly loves us, he has given us free will, right? The absolute ability to make our own choices in life. That being said, you know, mistakes are going to happen. And they're going to continue to happen, you know, all throughout the process of our own development, right, as he prepares us for heaven. Amen? And because God's in the business of, of running a school, right, he knows that by allowing us to experience, you know, these failures and, and pain and struggle, that we'll eventually know better. Right, sooner or later, the stronger will grow in faith, right, and essentially draw closer to him, gradually turning away from sin as he refines our character. Because he'll even go as far as to arrange things to where if we have a tendency to make a certain mistake, he'll allow us to make that mistake, right? But in a fashion that is as small as possible for us to learn our lesson. Let's just say that in his school of learning, he keeps the tuition as cheap as possible well, for his students, right? Well, He's working all these things good for those who love him. Amen. And as much as we, you know, as much as we love and, and want the very best for our own children, right? Just imagine how much more he feels about us. And let's just be fortunate that God, that, that, that God doesn't say, oh, well, you know, I love me some, some JR, so I'll keep him from, from suffering, right? I don't want to see him suffer. Yeah. Teaches us valuable lessons. Yeah. Teaches us valuable lessons, especially in marriage. Have you guys heard of the three rings in marriage? You guys heard of the three? All right, well, the first ring, right, you, you know, you, got, you, you have, the first ring we have is the engagement ring, right? The second ring, you know, we have the, the, the wedding ring. And the third ring is the suffering. <laughs> That's right. And so we definitely learn from the things we suffer from, amen? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 278, reverses will teach caution, we learn by the things we suffer. Thus, we gain experience. 
we gain experience. I've heard a person say that good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from exercising bad judgment. In other words, good judgment comes from experience, which comes from bad judgment. You guys follow that? Now, it would be nice and much easier to learn good judgment without any experience, right? That would be, be the easy way to gain experience. But imagine, imagine learning how to ride a bike by just reading the manual, right, without, without actually getting on the bike, right? Or even learning how to drive a car without getting behind the wheel, right? Although I do question, you know, some drivers. My wife, <coughs> just uh, Just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah, she drove a couple hours last night, so (laughs) thank you. Yeah. So that wouldn't really cut it that way, right? It wouldn't be as as effective as as it really should. And so we need to understand that with only experience, okay? And the experience that teaches us good judgment comes from the experience out of bad judgment. So overall, it's the experience that teaches us. Now let me tell you about one of the hardest lessons to learn about all this. And, you know, it's, it's when you go through a trial, right? And you're, you're, just, you're scratching your head because you see no purpose or a lesson coming out of it whatsoever. Have you ever gone through a trial like that? And you're asking God, how or why am I going through this right now? Right? Because the thing is, I can at least blame myself and not the stove for being so hot and burning my finger, right? Or I can even blame someone else for intentionally running a red light and crashing into my car. Right? Or at least if I survive, I can do them, right? But there are some trials where, or that come along the way where, you know, there's absolutely no one to blame, right? You can't blame your mom. You can't blame your dad. You can't blame your cat, right? Because, you know, it seems like we're always looking for someone to blame, right? It's the things that happen that insurance companies call acts of God. Have you ever heard that statement before? Acts of God. Events like an earthquake or a tornado or maybe like a sudden death in the family, right? Things that we have no control over whatsoever that can cause damage or hardship, you know, to our lives, right? And so we're quick to think, you know, how could that ever work together for good? How can I be positive about my house burning down and have having nowhere to live. Let me read an interesting statement here from a letter that Ellen White wrote to her son, who was, you know, he was going through some trials and afflictions uh, while trying to do some community work in, in, in Mississippi. Okay? Notice what she wrote to him. She said, keep the trusting spirit of a little child. Though you cannot understand the meaning of many trials, Though God does not explain them at all to you, because to explain them would be to destroy the object of them, to purify and ennoble the heart, yet that the simple faith be called forth in the thus saith the Lord, for you must have perfect trust. Now here he was, you know, he was going through some rough times, right? When he gets a letter from his mom that says, Edson, you know, that was the name of her son. Edson, I see you going through it, but listen. You need to keep the trusting of a little child. You might not understand the meaning of these trials, and God's not going to explain them to you either, because to explain them would only defeat the purpose of them. Yet it's to teach you to have faith and perfect trust in God. And so we need to keep the trusting spirit of a little child and say, Lord, I don't quite, you know, understand this this trial 
let alone I don't see anything good coming out of it either. But I do believe that something will. Only because you say so. Amen? And that's the best thing we can take from this, right? From all this. How many things work together for good? All. All things. To whom? To them that love God. Amen. Do you love God? Well, whether you love Him or not, you know, you're still given the privilege, right, to choose what you want to do. And that's the whole beauty of it. You know, we're talking about a free choice that God has, has so lovingly given us. And if I choose to love him and follow him, then I know, right, that my heavenly Father is working all things together for my good. Whether it's an injury, you know, or an illness, um, a change of employment, uh, loss of income, right, natural disaster, death, or whatever, you know, whatever the trial may be, God is taking all those things and working them together for our good. Isn't that wonderful? He's taking all those things into consideration and working them out for our good and for his glory. Now, one of the best promises I know is what Jesus said to Peter in John 13, 7, before washing his feet. He said, what I do thou knowest, not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. In other words, what you don't know now, you'll understand hereafter or later. And until God's hereafter comes, what do you think we need to do in the meantime? Trust Him. That's right. We need to fully trust and put our faith in Him. Amen? They say faith is the Christian's radar that sees through the mist. Have you guys ever heard that before? Faith is the Christian's radar that sees through the mist. So when a trial comes for no reason, but without any purpose or understanding, you better believe there is one. Behind all that mist, right? God is working it all together for your good and for His purpose. And I, you know, I can't even stress that enough. In Ministry of Healing, page 474, we're promised, in the future life, the mysteries that here have annoyed and disappointed us, will be made plain. We shall see that our seemingly unanswered prayers and disappointed hopes have been among our greatest blessings. You know, eventually there came a time when it was all made clear to Joseph, right, the meaning of all the trials and, and afflictions that God had allowed him to experience throughout his life in Egypt. And so having said that, who knows? You know, your time may come in this life, my time may come in this life, when all will eventually be revealed. When all the mysteries that have annoyed and disappointed us will be made plain. And if and when it does, I know... It's going to be a wonderful unveiling. It's going to be an amazing revelation, just as it was for Joseph and all those other people we read about in the Bible. And in the meantime, what do we need to do? That's right. We need to trust Him. We need to learn to live by faith. Not to say that we shouldn't examine our lives every so often, right? But no matter what, we need to trust that God is working it all together for good to those that truly love Him and to those who are willing to learn every lesson that they're given. Now, to this day, He's teaching me to be more careful. He's teaching me to be more wise and patient. And when I don't see any lesson coming out of it, what lesson can I learn? It's to be trustful to put my hand in my Father's hand and walk with Him. Now, before I close, there's a story about a little boy who was uh, walking down the street with his dad in one of the busiest parts of, of New York City. And so the dad thought he'd test his little guy, right? 
And he says, son, where are we going? And so the boy looked up and said, daddy, I don't know, but you do. You see, there's times in life where we need to be with God just like that little boy and his dad. And I know there's, you know, there are things going on in our lives right now where we just have to say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going, but I know that you do. Amen? We are to keep the trusting spirit of a little child. It's all better for him to know than for me to know. I'm sorry. It's all better for him to know and not me to know than for me to know and not him. You guys follow that? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To have your hand in your father's hand and to know that he's running this whole entire universe for our benefit. And I hope that gives you the peace and joy and reassurance and encouragement. Not obtained through the circumstances that are surrounding us, but from a Father's love that rules over everything. You know, Jesus had the same confidence when he came down and took on our own humanity. He lived the life that we live today with the same, you know, resources that are available to us, right? And even if it meant that following the cross, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, did it work together for our good? How about for his good? Absolutely, right? Isaiah says, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Christ loved us so much, he died to save us. Rather than live without us and see us lost. Now, ultimately, his His greatest trials and sacrifice worked out for the good of all of us, right? And he'll continue to do it for each and every one of us who love him. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 1 Peter 5.10. How many of you want to thank God this morning? Please stand with me and let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come, to you, we come before you this afternoon uh, with a grateful heart because you so loved the world and gave the greatest gift of all in your son, Jesus Christ. That whoever believes in him will not perish and have everlasting life. Father, please accept the offering of our praise and gratitude and send us out to share with others the good news of your love through Jesus Christ. We love you, Father, and we thank you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.